Hey everyone, in this lesson we're talking about Von Willebrand disease. Von Willebrand disease is important because it is the most common inherited bleeding disorder and Von Willebrand disease is due to an issue with Von Willebrand factor. We're going to talk about more about that later on in the lesson. It's so common that it affects about 1% of the population and men and women are equally affected. It is inherited through autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive, depending on the type of von Willebrand disease. And we're also going to talk about more about the types of von Willebrand disease later on. The von Willebrand factor gene or VWF gene is the culprit. And this is located on chromosome 12. So von Willebrand factor or VWF has particular functions in hemostasis. One important function of von Willebrand factor is that it is important in platelet aggregation and adhesion. So how does it do this? Well, with platelets, platelets have a receptor known as glycoprotein 2B3A or GP2B3A. Von Willebrand factor binds to this receptor. Von Willebrand factor is itself a glycoprotein. It can bind to glycoprotein 2B3A not only on only one platelet, but it can bind to that same receptor on multiple platelets, leading to these platelets being able to essentially stick together. This leads to uh, platelet aggregation and adhesion. Von Willebrand factor also acts as a chaperone for factor 8. It can also regulate angiogenesis, and it's also important in bone metabolism. So the von Willebrand factor, factor 8 complex has been shown to inhibit rank L-induced osteoclastogenesis. So it has multiple functions. Von Willebrand factor is located or it forms what we call Weibel palade bodies. So it's, these are essentially vesicles filled with von Willebrand factor. They're located in the endothelium and then they can essentially release von Willebrand factor into circulation. Von Willebrand factor is also interesting because it exists as a set of multimers of different sizes. And essentially, the largest of the multimers are responsible for platelet aggregation and adhesion. So if we have larger von Willebrand factor, they're able to bind to even more platelets to form uh, larger platelet aggregates. So that's why the largest of the von Willebrand factor multimers are important and responsible for platelet adhesion and aggregation. So when it comes to von Willebrand's disease, what are some of the clinical features? There is a history of bleeding. Now, von Willebrand's disease bleeding is not as severe as other bleeding disorders. Generally, we see mucocutaneous bleeds. These include bleeds of the gingiva, so um, bleeds um, around uh, individuals' teeth, um, so bloody gums. They can also have epistaxis, so uh, bloody nose. They can also have menorrhagia. This can be one of the most common findings with von Willebrand disease patients. Generally with women um, with von Willebrand disease, uh, von Willebrand's disease, they may not know they have the disease, but they have a history of menorrhagia and individuals in their family have menorrhagia. This can be a clue to uh, figuring out if these individuals have von Willebrand's disease or not. Some other um, Features include easy bruising, GI bleeds, post-operative bleeding, and immediate bleeding after trauma. This distinguishes it itself from other types of bleeding disorders, which generally have bleeds a little bit after a trauma. Now, most of it is mucocutaneous bleeding, but with a certain type of von Willebrand disease, type 3, we actually see musculoskeletal bleeding. This is the more severe case of von Willebrand disease. So how do we classify it? We classify it into three types. Type 1 is what we call mild 
quantitative defect. It generally means that there's a decreased amount in activity of von Willebrand factor. Majority of cases fall within type 1, generally around 80% of cases. And this is when we call this an autosomal dominant uh, inheritance. Type 1 is autosomal dominant inheritance. We generally see this run through families. Again, coming back to that same example with menorrhagia, we see women throughout the family having menorrhagia. It may be type 1 von Willebrand disease. Type 2 has several subtypes. Type 2 is generally what we call qualitative or a functional defect. So we have von Willebrand factor, but it is not as active. It has a decreased activity or decreased function. Type 2A, so there are four subsets or four subcategories of type 2. 2A is impaired multimerization. We have the von Willebrand factor, but it doesn't multimerize as well as it should, and it, that would in, lead to an impairment in platelet aggregation and adhesion, since larger multimers are more responsible for the platelet adhesion and aggregation. Type 2b is what we call hyperfunctional platelet binding. It essentially um, will bind too much to platelets. 2M has decreased glycoprotein 1B binding, and 2N has decreased factor 8 binding. So all of these have important consequences. The last type, type 3, is what we call a severe total quantitative defect. Essentially, no von Willebrand factor is produced in this uh, type. And this is the rarest or the most uncommon of the, uh, the types of von Willebrand disease. It is an autosomal recessive inheritance. And with regards to type 2, depending on the subcategory of type 2, it can either be autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive inheritance. Now when we look at an agarose gel, looking at the different multimers of von Willebrand factor, we can see how these types look. Type 2A seen here, we see that there is impaired multimerization. The largest multimers are missing, so we only have the smallest ones. With type 2B, we have hyperfunctional platelet binding, so it's normal, but it binds to platelets inappropriately. Type 1, we see, is a mild quantity quantitative defect is decreased amount. There's an actual, you can see a lightening of the bands here. And type three, and type three there's actually nothing. There's no von Willebrand factor formed. So in this agarose, you can actually see the different types um, here. Now, before I move on, I want to talk about an acquired von Willebrand disease. Acquired von Willebrand's disease is associated with particular conditions. One of them is aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis due to the um, aortic valve and the stenosis and the decreased amount of area by which blood can go through that stenotic valve, it can lead to an acquired von Willebrand disease and it can lead to something known as Hades syndrome. This is similar to mechanical heart valves and mechanical heart valves can lead to an acquired von Willebrand's disease. And both of these are really due to a stenotic valve or something that causes shear stress. The shear stress can basically tear or unravel the von Willebrand's factor, making it uh, less functional. And Another condition that causes an acquired von Willebrand's disease is Wilms tumor. Generally, all of these acquired von Willebrand's disease are due to a depletion of von Willebrand factor simply because of, a lot of times, sheer stress leading to a unraveling and destruction of von Willebrand factor. If we're suspicious on of von Willebrand's disease, how do we investigate it? What can we do to 
figure out if it is von Willebrand's disease. Some of these include some of the basics. We want we want to do a CBC to look at platelet count. We want to do an INR and a PTT. We also want to do von Willebrand's factor activity and von Willebrand factor antigen. So we want to look at how how much von Willebrand factor there is and how much activity that von Willebrand factor has. We also want to look at factor eight, and these can all help us to determine what if the patient has von Willebrand's disease, and is it, um, and it can help us determine what type it is. We can also look into genetic testing as well. Now, blood type. Before I move on, blood type is important to keep in mind because the blood type of an individual can affect the presentation pathology of von Willebrand's disease. Interestingly, type O blood types have generally lower levels of von Willebrand's factor. This doesn't mean that they have von Willebrand's disease, but on average, people with type O blood have slightly lower levels of von Willebrand's factor than other blood types. And on the opposite side, type AB have higher levels of von Willebrand's factor than other blood types. So when we want to make the diagnosis of von Willebrand's disease, we have to think about the patient's blood type. We have to keep that in mind. So how do we make the diagnosis? Again, it all comes down to the level of activity and the level of von Willebrand's factor. Decreased level of activity and antigen, we call that type one. So we still have von Willebrand's factor, but it's in a decreased amount. And again, we gotta keep that in context with the person's blood type. If we find that the activity is low, generally lower than 0.6 of the antigen level, so activity is lower than the amount of von Willebrand's factor, this is a functional problem. This is either type 2A or type 2B von Willebrand's disease. If we see that factor 8 is a lot less than von Willebrand's factor, this is considered type 2N. And if we see no von Willebrand factor at all, this is type 3. Once we made the diagnosis, treatment generally involves a couple of things. One is desmopressin or DDAVP. DDAVP is a, a vasopressin, a synthetic vasopressin analog, and it's used to treat type 1 and 2A von Willebrand's disease. It's generally not um, as helpful for other types. The desmopressin itself induces the release of von Willebrand's factor and factor 8 from endothelial cells. So whatever we have, whatever von Willebrand factor we have, and whatever factor 8 we have, desmopressin induces the release of these uh, factors from endothelial cells. Now, in other cases, in other severe cases, we might need to use factor 8 transfusion. We might also need to, um, depending on the clinical uh, picture, we might need to do blood transfusions um, if there's severe bleeds to correct for anemias, those types of things. But generally, these are the two types of treatments. We use desmopressin for some of the less severe cases, type 1 and 2A von Willebrand's disease. And sometimes we'll use a factor 8 transfusion if factor 8 is low. So anyways, guys, I hope you found this lesson helpful. This was a lesson on von Willebrand's disease. If you found this lesson helpful, please like and subscribe for more videos like this one. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.